On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue looks at how Jesus tells us to be happy, the Beatitudes. And we think we can be happy by living a worldly life. Now Jesus comes to us and presents a very different picture. In the Sermon on the Mount, he presents to us a totally different way to happiness. He presents the Beatitudes. When I've traveled around and spoken at different conferences, especially with youth, I would often start with the question, who here wants to be happy? Raise your hand. And as you can imagine, pretty much everyone in the group or the congregation will raise their hand. And in fact, if I did this and went to Australia or Timbuktu or anywhere in the world, you get the same answer. Everyone wants to be happy. It's a desire that's universal. And in fact, the early Greek philosophers and other people, even before the time of Christ, would say that. They would say, we are made for happiness. And you might notice that advertising on TV or on the radio will tap into this universal desire. How do they do that? Well, they portray people who are happy in their ads. And it's people who are using their product, right? So you'll see oftentimes the handsome young man who is in the Porsche or some really nice car, and he's got the girl at his side, and he's got the perfect hair, the perfect threads, and he's got the perfect smile, a Colgate smile. Right? or some other ad for some product. And the point is, none of those things really have anything to do with the product. <laughs> they have to do with happiness. They're selling happiness, and they want you to buy your, their product to get it. But you know, the portrayals of these types of happiness that we see in the world in advertising, as one example, are often the happy person is the one who's got the wealth, right, to sell us a quick rich, get rich quick scheme. Or it's someone who is, you know, maybe taking the recreational drugs or is looking for the next high, or the one who is really powerful or has the popularity. Everyone, everyone knows your name. Everyone loves you, at least this week, right? But the truth is that you can have all of those things. You can have the popularity, the pleasure, the wealth, the money, the fame, and you can be desperately, I mean desperately, unhappy. Because even teenage Hollywood stars, you see it, they have it all, and they commit suicide. Why is that? Multi-million dollar rock stars are overdosing on drugs. Are they happy? No. They're longing for happiness, but they haven't found it. They're looking in all the wrong places. And after 15 or 20 years of hearing this and seeing this in the world, we start to believe it ourselves. And we think we can be happy by living a worldly life. Now, Jesus comes to us and presents a very different picture. In the Sermon on the Mount, he presents to us a totally different way to happiness. He presents the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, he goes through the Beatitudes, which talk about happiness. Beatitude means that, blessedness, happiness. And he says, these are the roads to happiness. And I just want to quote to you what he says will lead there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow, what a list. Can you imagine? This is exactly the opposite of the list that the world gives. Instead of exalting wealth and pleasure and power and popularity, Jesus proposes a totally different way. He exalts poverty, meekness, mercy, purity, all of these virtues, these holy habits, 
are roads to true happiness. And to drive the point home, in another account of the Beatitudes, in Luke's Gospel, he follows up the blessed are yous with the woe to yous, and kind of the inverse, the flip side. And he says, woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are filled now, you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, you will grieve and weep. And woe to you when all speak well of you, for the ancestors treated the false prophets in the same way. Now, when we listen to that, we're like, wow, does this mean the next time someone compliments me or says a good thing about me, I should run for cover? You know, woe is me. <laughs> I'm going to get it? No. No, that's not what Jesus means. That's not what he's saying. We're not supposed to just stop laughing at jokes and stop eating and refuse our next promotion. <laughs> it's not what he's getting at. But what he does mean is that we should not be seeking after riches and comfort and entertainment or human praise as the source of our happiness. You see, if we build our happiness on that foundation, we're setting ourselves up for a fall because there's gonna come a time when the money runs out or when the high from the drugs wears off and the high-tech toys that we bought to keep us entertained all break down or become obsolete or the human praise moves on to next week's or next year's big-time movie star. And then, if our happiness is rooted in those things, then we fall, we crash. And God doesn't want that for us. Instead, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you besides. If you go after the wealth and the money and the fame, you'll lose it all. You'll crash and burn. But if you go after God, and his kingdom, and his righteousness. He will give you everything that you need, and you will be satisfied, and you will be happy. These are the Beatitudes. Now, sometimes we think of the Beatitudes as God is going to bless different categories of people, the poor, those who don't have this, or who are mourning. And, you know, since I don't fall into any of those categories, well, I guess I, guess I missed the boat. You know, I'm not blessed. But that's not what Jesus is getting at. Because the Beatitudes aren't categories of people, they're attitudes of the heart that Jesus wants every disciple to have. Not just for the few, for everyone. They describe attitudes of the heart, virtues, holy habits that Christians should develop in order to grow closer to God and be more like God and be happy. So. These Beatitudes are the antidote. These are Jesus' answer to all the problems of the world, to our own sins, in fact. You've probably heard of the phrase, the seven deadly sins, or the seven capital sins. I don't know, maybe some of you might be able to, to list them off. The things like pride and greed and lust and gluttony and envy and sloth and anger. What I'd like to do is hit those up against the Beatitudes and show you how the Beatitudes conquer the seven deadly sins. And this particular way of, of matching them up um, to the seven deadly sins, I, I got from a book by Peter Kreeft. It's called Back to Virtue. And in this book, he describes some of the things I'll be sharing with you now. Let's start with the, the first of the, the deadly sins, the things that pull us away from God, the things that the world glorifies, pride. That's probably number one on the list. That's turning in on yourself. It's wanting the whole world to revolve around you or to serve you. That's pride. Thinking that you're more important than others. I did it my way, and my way is the only way. That's the sin of pride. It's like Satan saying, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Now, the opposite of that is humility. It's being humble. It's like Jesus who humbles himself obediently unto death, giving up everything, giving up all the power, emptying himself. And it's like his disciples, like Mary, who says, let it be done unto me according to your word. She doesn't take the place of pride. She becomes the handmaid of the Lord, the servant, and God blesses her for it. So the opposite of pride is being poor in spirit, being lower, being lowly. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the antidote 
to pride. Second, greed. This is when we want more than we need. When it's all for me and enough is never enough, and we take more than we deserve for ourselves. The opposite of that is giving to others more than they deserve instead of taking for myself more than I deserve. That's called mercy when we give to others more than they deserve. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. How about lust? Lust would be excessive sexual desire, just seeking to satisfy every passion that you have. And it leads to the abuse of people. It's using people instead of treating them with the dignity and respect that they have as children of God made in his image. We treat them as objects, as the source of our pleasure. And we turn something beautiful, which is sexual relations, we turn that into something perverse. So the opposite of that is to respect the dignity of the person, to be chaste and recognize their dignity. And that leads to purity in our hearts. We seek after one thing, the greatest good for the beloved. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. If you have this purity, you'll see God in your spouse. You'll see God in the boyfriend or the girlfriend that you have. You won't just see them as an object for your pleasure. How about anger? Now, anger here is there's a sin of anger, which is when we lose control. We lose rational control of our emotions, and we express them in a way that hurts other people. I'm not talking about righteous anger, where we're motivated to correct or to right the wrong that was done, and where it's controlled and, and used appropriately, I'm talking about this, this rage or turning on someone and causing pain and inflicting harm, either verbally or physically, or even by your attitude, the silent treatment, that can be anger, <laughs> rooted in anger. All of these sins are roots that other sins can flow out of. That's why they're called capital sins. The head, capital, leads to all these other things in our lives. So the opposite, there are actually two in the Beatitudes. First of all, is to love our enemies, is to not react in anger when someone does something wrong to us. That's called meekness. It doesn't mean that we're weak and that we just allow ourselves to get rolled over. It means we're strong enough not to react in anger when we're hurt or when we're treated wrongly, that we have the interior strength not to lash back. That takes guts to do it the right way, to do it God's way. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. And the second thing is not when I'm unjustly treated, but maybe there are two other people who are in a battle, a confrontation, maybe something in your family you don't know how to deal with. And you can be the one who comes and steps in and helps to bring peace in that situation. Then you are acting in a way that leads to happiness. Because blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. How about gluttony, when we eat too much, or we indulge in other pleasures of the flesh too much? Drink, drugs, too much sleep, too much television even? Too much of something that can be good. This is when we're seeking after comfort. The image I have for this is where you've got the nice big box of Godiva chocolates, and you're sitting on your nice comfortable chair, and you're lined up for the next 10 soap operas on all your favorite channels, <laughs> okay? It can end up being like that, where we seek after our own comfort. What's the opposite? Well, it's bearing with suffering, bearing with persecution, bearing with things that we don't like for the sake of God's kingdom. And Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How about envy? Envy is when we look at someone else and their success, and we get angry or sad about it, and we want to take it away from them. We want to ruin their lives so that maybe we'll look better. Now, that's raising ourselves up by putting someone else down. And an example of this, I actually heard this on a, on a, a TV show. There was another preacher on TV who gave an example of, imagine that we're part of the body of Christ, right? 
Each one of us is a member of the body of Christ. And so, like, I'm an eye, and someone else is a hand, and someone else is a foot in the body. And it's all supposed to work together to glorify God. Well, envy is when the eye looks at the pretty ring that's on the finger of the hand and says, well, I wish the hand didn't have that ring. I want the ring, and tries to get it. But think about it. What would the eye do with a ring? It just prevents the eye from seeing. You know, try to balance, you know, balance the ring on the eye, and you're walking around, right? Or maybe, you know, the hand looks at the foot and says, oh, look at those pretty shoes. I wish I had those shoes. And so the hand goes and grabs one of the shoes and puts it on. And so here's the body of Christ. Can't even look, see where it's going, because it's got a ring on its finger, and it's got shoes on its hands, and it's bumping into every wall. And we wonder why the body of Christ is in such a mess. What are we doing? This is the, this is the fruit of envy. You see, what we ought to do, if we're the eye and we see the ring on the hand, we should ask God, hey, God, can you give me something that will bless me, that will help me? Maybe some, I don't know, eye shadow <laughs> or, or glasses if you need those. In other words, God has something for you, has a blessing for you, and that is what you ought to be seeking, not to tear the other parts of the body of Christ down. And this is when we rejoice in the success of the others. When one member of the body of Christ is glorified, then we rejoice in their success. And when one other member of the body of Christ is suffering or is in need or has lost something, we mourn with them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is the beatitude. This is the virtue to have compassion for others. Finally, the, virtue, the, the deadly sin of sloth. Now, we often think of sloth as laziness, and that's true, but specifically, it's in spiritual matters. You can be the busiest person. You can have all your, you know, be a very efficient, highly organized, motivated guy, but ignore the spiritual life. Ignore God. Not spend time with him in prayer. Not seek after the things of God because you're so busy doing the things of the world. And that's sloth, even though you're very efficient. So the opposite of this is when we're hungering and we're thirsting for the things of God, when we're looking for God and his kingdom and trying to bring it about. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So you see, each one of these beatitudes conquers, is opposed to, fights against a deadly sin. And this is the challenge for us. What sin are we caught up in? Oftentimes we have a particular thing that we struggle with, maybe habitually. It's something that we, we don't really know how to deal with in our lives. Can we identify it? Can we trace it back to a root cause of one of these seven deadly sins? If we can, if we really look at our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to stir that up in us, then we can do something about it. We can practice the opposing virtue, the opposing beatitude. We can go on the offensive, not just play good defense. We need to do that. We need to avoid occasions of sin, try to live a holy life. We need to confess our sins and be honest and accountable to God. But we need to go further than that. <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are you if you'll do these things, if you'll practice these virtues. Cooperate with God and his Holy Spirit working in you. We need to go on the offensive in our spiritual life. It's like a hockey player. You can't just have a hockey team that plays good defense. You've got to go score some goals sometime. <laughs> You've got to go after those things that will make us like God, make us holy. So focus on that virtue that you lack. Identify it. Pick a beatitude and pray specifically for it. Maybe write it down. Put it on your mirror. Go to places in the life of Christ where he exhibits this beatitude, where he's being merciful, where he's mourning with those who mourn, and start to look into, do a word study, a Bible study on those scriptures. Find the life of someone who, who exemplifies this virtue. It might be the life of one of the saints who has gone on before us. St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. So we can look to other Christians who seem to have this virtue and see how they live it out in their day-to-day -day life. Give us examples from modern times or recent times to follow so that we can follow Christ better. And finally, if we do this, 
we're going to experience the happiness that comes from the Beatitudes. It comes from the heart of God because we will receive the peace that passes all understanding, the peace and the joy that the world can't give because the world doesn't have it. It's a peace that's rooted in God and doesn't fade away because God never changes and he lasts forever. And the joy that you experience by following Jesus will never go away. You know that passing high of the world, of drugs, of pleasure in the world? It's going to fade. It's going to go. But God will never fail. And Jesus promises to give you something pure gold when the world offers gold-plated on the outside and rotten on the inside. So after you've tried the fame and the popularity and the power, go to Jesus. He'll be with you when you're mourning, when you're hungering and you're thirsting, and through all the persecution of your life. And he'll be there blessing you, and you'll have the joy and the peace and the blessing of God forever. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Be Happy, the Beatitudes, please write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Be Happy, the Beatitudes. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at the story of salvation. We're told in the center of the garden there was a tree called the Tree of Life. And if they would have eaten the fruit of that tree, they would have lived forever. And so God banished them from the garden so that they wouldn't be able to eat the tree from the Tree of Life and live forever. Now you can ask yourself, well, well why wouldn't God want uh, them to live forever? All of us as Christians want to have a real confidence in the Lord. First of all, that He's there and He hears our prayers, that He loves us and that He's guiding us. But sometimes we face trials in our lives and our confidence is shaken. Does He really love us? Is He answering our prayers? And we might even ask, is He even there at all? All of us have our faith stretched from time to time and our confidence can be shaken. I have a letter I want to read to you today from a viewer who talks about confidence in the Lord. This viewer writes, Food for Life is filling our spiritual cups. My husband was directed to your program, Food for Life. He has a small business and needed God's help to preserve him through these difficult times of recession. Clear messages came through Food for Life that we have the help that we need from the Holy Spirit. My husband is happy and confident that God will help us make it through this difficult time. Every time I now view Food for Life, I cry with happiness and joy because you're spreading God's love in practical ways, giving examples of daily problems and fears. You're filling the gap. Keep up the excellent work. I was so encouraged as I read this letter, and the one point that really jumped out to me is that in the midst of this trial he's experiencing financial and through the recession that, that we're currently experiencing, he is confident that the Lord will bring him through. He's still in the midst of it, but he has that confidence. And that's the good news, is that we can have confidence in the Lord, even in the midst of our problems, as he brings us through. I can't help but think of Isaiah 43, verse 1. And I want to read that to you. The Lord says to us, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This scripture verse is one that every one of us can find comfort from. I know that I would personally rather jump over the water or jump over the fire, but God allows us to go through it. And he is always faithful to bring us through it. Trials are nothing new in life, but our confidence doesn't have to be shaken. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised. 1 Peter 4.12 says that we should not be surprised at the fiery ordeal surrounding us, as though some strange thing were happening to us. 
Likewise, in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, we are told that we're to consider it joy when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. And that's what we're going for, that enduring faith that keeps our confidence high in the Lord. I think of a beautiful board member that I've had the privilege of working with. She's a board member of Food for Life and has served with us for years. And she's gone through so many ups and downs and not just small little trials. I mean things like heart conditions and cancer and very serious prayer requests that she's brought to my attention. And I remember saying to her, you know, you're just so confident. Her attitude's amazing. She has this enduring faith. And she's older and her kids are grown. And she said, well, you know, I've seen the Lord bring me through many trials, through many fires, and he's always faithful to bring me through. And she just has this everlasting confidence. And that's what each and every one of us wants to reach. You know, everything that we experience in life that God allows us to experience has a purpose. It has a meaning. We might get through that fire, through that river, and look back, and then we see why we had to go through it. On the other hand, we may never know. But in any event, we can trust in God, have confidence in Him, that He's with us through whatever we face. Our confidence need not be shaken. If you have a prayer request that we can join you in today, we count it a privilege to pray for you. We invite you to write in and we'll pray for your request. God bless you. It's our joy to serve you here on on Food for Life. We know that many people are really blessed by our ministry here. I travel around Canada and and speak with a lot of people who who really are blessed by our our ministry. And so we thank you for, for joining us on Food for Life and once again invite you to uh, to support our ministry through through your prayers and also your your financial uh, gifts Uh, the the ministry of course relies on the financial support of our viewers and so we we just once again invite you to consider uh, making a donation to food for life ministry so that we can continue this good work that the lord has has begun uh, here in, in Food for Life. Thank you and God bless you. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1410 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on Be Happy the Beatitudes. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. If every viewer gave a loony or a toony each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website at www dot foodforlifetvministry dot org and follow the link. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at the story of salvation. We're told in the center of the garden there was a tree called the tree of life. And if they would have eaten the fruit of that tree, they would have lived forever. And so God banished them from the garden so that they wouldn't be able to eat the tree from the tree of life and live forever. And you can ask yourself, well, well, why wouldn't God want uh, them to live forever? For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Be Happy, the Beatitudes, please write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8.